In the modern West, as religious communities, when we think about the Bible and religion and politics, the Bible doesn't offer a divine endorsement for any kind of political form of organized government. It, it, it gives a very thorough exploration of what political power is, but it doesn't endorse any particular form of government. The Bible asks us to believe a lot of strange things about the spiritual world. At first we might be tempted to ignore them, but if we say we believe the Bible, we can't avoid these concepts. For the biblical writers, the unseen realm was home to more than angels and demons. There were other, bigger players. So do you believe what's in your Bible? When we ask the question of how does the Bible think about humans exercising power or authority, where's the first time that you will find that, that topic um, touched upon and explored? Can you guess what page? Pa on page one. It's like really, really important to the story of the Bible. So uh, God is depicted in Genesis chapter one as the one who has authority. Um, when God encounters the formless emptiness, or in Hebrew, tohu vavohu, it's a little rhyme phrase, <clears throat> the dark, chaotic void, what God does is he asserts his authority over the chaos, and through these acts of speaking, God transforms the chaotic darkness into a garden where life can flourish. But it doesn't end there. God's clearly the one who has authority. And what does God do with God's authority? On page one, he takes chaotic darkness and makes it a place for life. But then, at the pinnacle of God's speaking and acting um, is these famous lines right here. Genesis chapter one, verse 26 and following. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image. Ah, one second. Um, mankind, who uses, do you guys use that word in normal, normal like conversation? Mankind. What word do you use? Yeah, humans. <laughs> humans. Or humanity would be like the more abstract concept. Um, in Hebrew, it's the word Adam. Adam. Uh, and it's, it's really, uh, there's a connection here because of the word dirt or soil. Uh, is the Hebrew word Adama. And so God takes from the Adama and, uh, and so uh, is formed the Adam. And so it's a very, it's, it's not just talking about physical composition. These stories are talking about who we are and, and what are human beings. We're earthlings, <laughs> literally. literally. <laughs> We're earthlings. Um, we, and how do you know that? Because when, you know, in their very traditional culture, you still bury your ancestors. When you, you know, were a little kid and you help bury a gram grandma or a grandpa, you know, and wrap their body, and then you put them in the tomb, and then six months later, you go gather what's left, and then you put it in a bone box and so on. And what's left of grandma and grandpa after six months? It's just decayed matter, it's dirt. We return to the dust. We come from the dust and we return to the dust. And so from God's good world that he has just primed and made ready for life to emerge, he appoints Adam. He says, let us make Adam in our image. God addressed his counsel when he created the first man and woman. The counsel was already there. So God created humankind in his image. In the likeness of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God told his heavenly family he wanted to create humanity. Now people often think God addressed the other members of the Trinity, but that is not the case. The other members of the Trinity are co-equal and co-omniscient. God wouldn't need to tell them anything. 
God speaks to his heavenly host here. Job 38 tells us the sons of God were present at the creation. Where were you at my laying the foundation of the earth? When the morning stars were singing together and all of the sons of God shouted for joy. The image of God concept helps us to understand how humans and the heavenly host are both like God. Both of God's families represent him. The supernatural sons of God represent him in the unseen realm. And we represent God on earth. To be human is to image God, but God also shares his attributes with us. Beginning with Adam and Eve, we were supposed to take care of creation and develop it. God wanted the whole earth to be like Eden. So there's a lot of long history, 2,000, even longer, 3,000 years of Jewish and Christian conversation about what, what this means. Um, much later, in kind of the later Christian period, what the image is turned into a whole series of debates about, is it like rationality or reason or morality or the capability for relationships? Um, but in the Jewish tradition, um, it's very, the interpretation of what the image is uh, is, is fairly simple, and it's because they're just, they're just reading in context exactly what God says the image results in. Um, God says, let us make Adam in our image and in our likeness for what purpose? So that humans may rule. Rule, it's the first time the word rule or to have power, to exercise authority appears in the Bible. It's on page one. Um, and whatever the, the image is, it, it's not something that humans possess, it's something that humans are. And it's, it's involved in what humans do. So humans are these physical representations of the, of the beautiful mind that, that architected and originated everything in the first part of, of page one. And what does the beautiful mind do? The beautiful mind has authority over darkness and chaos he speaks order, light, and time, and day and night, and weather, and, the whole, and all of a sudden the chaos becomes this organized, ordered space. And then what God does is he places images. I, it's, literally, it's the word for idols. Um, the, the word image here, it's the standard word used throughout the rest of um, the Hebrew Bible for idol statue. So it's the, it's the Hebrew word selim. An ancient person would build an idol, okay, stone, wood, whatever it is, and they're not idiots. They know that they just built that thing. The idea wasn't that this is my deity and then, then it just dies there. The idea is that I will build this object as a home for a spiritual entity. They would do ceremonies on the idol, like the opening of the mouth because opening of the mouth, that means it's alive because it takes in breath and all that kind of stuff, just like someone who's breathing is alive. Well, they would transfer that thinking to this object. They would perform some ritual with the idea that when we open the mouth, the entity, the spirit entity, will come and inhabit the object or attach itself to the object. That's why in ancient texts, when idols were destroyed, people aren't thinking, oh my God's dead now. No, they're thinking, man, when I get home, I got to build another one and then apologize for letting that happen to the first house and then do the ritual again. And then the deity will come back and reside with me or in this temple or whatever it is. So there's a, there's a connection. There's a direct connection between idols and Elohim gods in the ancient world. They're not, you know, separable things in that one is real and the other isn't. The whole reason you created an idol was to get this real entity to attach itself to it and be with you so that you can barter with it. This is the essence of polytheism. You placate the gods. You believe that they, you need them on your side to live a good life. Go to Deuteronomy 32, 17. The Israelites are accused of not worshiping God, capital G-O-D, but instead worshiping Shadim. And then the next line says Elohim that they had not known. So the Shadim are called Elohim. 
in that verse. Now, in the Septuagint, Shadim gets translated as demons, daimonion. Paul quotes that verse, Deuteronomy 32, 17, and 1 Corinthians 10, 21, and 22, when he warns the Corinthians about not eating meat that had been sacrificed to demons. Now, here's the question. For all of you who want to say, oh, it's just idols, they're just you know, objects of stone or whatever, and they don't have real entities behind them, why would Paul care then? Are you saying that Paul didn't believe that demons were real? I'm sorry, but Paul did. Okay, Paul quotes this passage using Elohim of these other entities that certainly did have idols made for them. In the biblical worldview, these were real entities that mattered because they were hostile and could lead people astray away from the true God. So this is, is a great irony on page one of the Bible because one of the first commandments that God's going to give to Israel is what? Never make any idols to represent the deity, represent God. But God can make idols of God's own self, and He did it one time. And it's here we are. It's a room full. <laughs> it's a room full of them. That's that's a very bold, very bold claim that would leap off the page to any ancient reader. Uh, because, it, you know, from an Israelite author to Israelite readers, their world and imaginations are full of statues that represent the deity. And Israel was never to make any of these. Why? Because any physical image will always reduce the creator to something within creation. But also, God's already made images of God's own self, and it's you. And it's the person sitting next to you. And so you will also dishonor your own dignity as an image-bearing human being if you ascribe power and divinity to a piece of wood or a piece of rock or to a piece of metal. You're actually dehumanizing your own value when you give your allegiance to something that's lesser than you, like a rock or a tree. It's very profound. Hey, isn't this amazing? that all humans are representatives of God prompts us to see all human life as sacred. It leaves no room for racism. Injustice has no place. And the abuse of power at home, at work, or in government cannot be justified. Obviously, the world isn't like Eden. People don't treat each other as equal imagers of God. Not even close. What happened? So when we talk about politics, po politics is a Greek word um, that comes from a, the root, a, root, a root Greek word, polis, which is the Greek word for city, like metropolis, spreading polis, city. So po politikos is we're talking about what are the conditions that make life good for a group of people who commit to living in an, a, a close-in environment together, what are the terms and the conditions by which they're going to get along? And so you, you could really easily say, Genesis chapter 1, page 1 of the Bible, is a political theology. It's describing the kind of world we're living in, who's behind it all. It's describing who we are and what our job is in the world as we inhabit it together. We're called to rule and subdue and to do it in a way that imitates God's tzedek, his love for tzedek, and his love, his love for mishpat. That's page one of the Bible. Call it a utopian vision, I don't know, but that's page one of the Bible. How long does the garden last? Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys are enjoying this series. It has revolutionized how I look at the Bible and how I view myself as a Christian in America. If you haven't yet, please subscribe like, share, turn on the alerts for this channel. All those things help us get the message out about what God has done for this world. And we're so excited to have you here along for the journey. Uh, this is a community and I've loved uh, having all the response and all the connection that I've had with you guys across the globe. So, so thankful you're here. Hope you're ready to find out what the Bible has to say about following Jesus faithfully here in America or across the globe. Let's check this out. Eden was the home and headquarters of God. 
His supernatural and earthly families resided there. God wanted them to image him in their own ways. Heaven and earth blended together into one family, but one family member didn't like that idea. We've all heard about the serpent in Eden, but why a serpent? Ancient Mesopotamian tablets talk about cherub throne guardians and describe them as snakes and dragons. The serpent of Eden was actually a supernatural being whose job was to guard God's throne. An ancient person would have known the scene was about a rebel in the divine council. So there's you know, two options. One is that the snake uh, had uh, its own rebellion and that that story is not narrated in Genesis, but it's presumed and then you get the backstory later on in the, in the Bible. Um, another possibility is that Genesis 3 is telling you the rebellion story of the snake and the human simultaneously. Mm, that is his rebellion. That it's the fall of the snake yeah. <laughs> and the fall of uh, Adam and Eve in the same story. Um, and I actually think that's, uh, mm. there's uh, some textual details that point in that direction. It's a, it's a perceptive, clever creature. Mm. Um, and what's interesting that uh, he's called, said, Arum mikol ha um, um crafty more than all the beasts of the field. Mm -hmm. What he ends up is being arur mikol ha behemot, cursed more than all the beasts of the mm, field. So play. within the course of the narrative, he goes from being arum to arur, mm. more than all the beasts. And I think that's a, oh. it's a literary it's design. It's Breaking Bad. Yes, yeah, totally. He's yeah. a good creature gone bad. Yeah, uh, okay. So the story portrays him as a fallen creature, just like the humans are going to be fallen creatures. Yeah. He's a rebel. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. Demon sex. Oh boy. Um, so, <laughs> what yes. we say in the video is one of the, mm -hmm. one yeah. of the strangest stories in the Bible is totally. in Genesis 6. Yes, it is. First few verses Strange there. to us. Strange to Strange us. Strange to the modern Westerners. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if you want to take it literally, yeah. they are the spawn of yeah. fallen yeah. spiritual beings. Yeah. You take it figuratively and they are just, they're possessed <laughs> yeah, yeah, by it. Yeah. So um, the sons of God in Genesis 6, um, uh, verses 1 and 2, the sons of God is the Old Testament phrase to talk about spiritual beings. Uh, it's parallel to the host of heaven. Uh, to the yeah. phrase angels and, and so on. Um, so, I, you know, the plain sense reading of the phrase sons of God. Um, okay, so that's one layer. Sorry. Well, sorry. My brain's going to do too mm. many things. The plain sense reading is spiritual beings uh, sexually abuse women. They yeah. take women. And then um, create the Nephilim. And, and, well, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. So one, another thing is that Genesis 6 is designed according to a design pattern to m imitate Genesis 3. Mm. In Genesis 3, you have a woman okay. and a spiritual being having a conversation. The woman sees that something is good and she takes it for herself. That's mm -hmm. the vocabulary of Genesis 3, verse 6. Yeah. Genesis 6 comes along as an inversion. Now it's not a, a woman taking as she talks to a spiritual being. It's the spiritual beings see that women are good mm. and they take for themselves. Mm. So it's they're, they're so little mirrors to, of each other. Supposed to see that this, these yes. are dual rebellions of yeah. sorts. It's intensifying the, the nature and scope of the combined human and spiritual rebellion. If mm. Genesis 3 is the first wave of spiritual human rebellion, mm. Genesis 6 is the next way. I mean, uniform, all of the earliest interpretations in Jesus' day, um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the book of First Enoch, in the book of Jubilees, the wisdom of Ben Sirah and Jesus' brother all read um, those stories as the, 
this screwed up merging of the sons of God and women produced the mutant warrior kings of old. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top reaches to the heavens. And Yahweh said, Come, let us go down and confuse their language there, so that they will not understand each other's language. Therefore, its name was called Babel. Now this is a really familiar story. Less familiar is how the story is told in Deuteronomy. When the Most High apportioned the nations, at his dividing up the sons of humankind, he fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. For Yahweh's portion was his people, Jacob the share of his inheritance. When was humanity divided into nations? That was at Babel. God allowed the nations to the members of his divine council. The Bible says this is why the ancient nations worshiped other gods. God decided to let the members of his divine council govern the other nations in response to humanity's rebellion at Babel. But the gods of the nations failed to rule justly. God chastises them in Psalm 82. God stands in the divine assembly. He administers judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show favoritism to the wicked? then God pronounces a judgment on them. I have said, you are gods and sons of the Most High, all of you. However, you will die like men and you will fall like one of the princes. The gods will be judged, punished, and will die. It's startling to read these things. God is so angry with his corrupt heavenly sons that he condemns them. Some passages in the prophets place the fulfillment of this punishment in the end times at the day of the Lord. For the anger of Yahweh is against all the nations, and his wrath is against all their host. All the host of heaven shall rot. All their host shall wither. On that day, Yahweh will punish the host of heaven in heaven, and the kings of the earth on the earth. Do we realize how dramatic the judgment at Babel really was? When it was over, God had no relationship with humanity. But God still wanted a family. And he already had a plan to fix that problem. He'd begin with one man named Abraham. And where the story goes from there, again, make a long story short, God chooses one family through whom he's going to restore his blessing to all the nations of the earth. That family grows big time, and then they end up down uh, in uh, the land of what? Where they're going looking for food, and they end up in what land? Land of Egypt. And how do things go for them there? They go get it first, uh, but then eventually um, things go really, really bad. And the story of what happens in Egypt is crucially important because it's the first biblical depiction of a corrupt superpower. It's, it's the first elaborate depiction of politics gone wrong in the Bible. And what do you have? You have uh, a king who uh, sees uh, here an immigrant population in his own land. They are being fruitful and multiplying like rabbits. And all of a sudden, the first thing he thinks is, oh my gosh, national security threat. He thinks of national security. And then what he does is he enslaves these people and he harnesses them towards uh, his own economic ends. They're building storehouses and cities. And then all of a sudden, be because his own power and the self-interest of his group and his tribe, he so redefined good and evil that it all of a sudden becomes good to start killing these people off in the interests of the security um, and economic safety of his own country. And so. Uh, he enacts a slow genocide of the Israelite people. It's a very uh, literarily realistic depiction of the world that you and I know, isn't it? We call it Exodus chapters 1 and 2. And the root of it uh, is in a very powerful moment in the story. It's in Exodus chapter 5. 
is where um, Moses goes to Pharaoh, the famous line, you've probably seen the movie, the old one or the new one, and uh, where, where Moses says, let my people go, that they may hold a festival to me. And Pharaoh says, who's that? Who's the Lord? I'm not going to obey him and let Israel go. I don't even know who Yahweh is. I'm not going to let Israel go. It's a really important moment in the story. So what you have is you, you go from rebellious humanity, you end up in Babylon, and now we end up in Egypt, who's the, the first major corrupt superpower. And what's it all rooted in? It's rooted in a ruler who won't acknowledge that the creator God is actually his authority. And so this uh, human authority has completely forgotten that he's an image. He thinks he's the reality. Who's Yahweh? And so what this, what this usurper ends up doing is ascribing his own national security and his own military security. He like elevates it up to the heavens and gives it a divine stamp of authority and power. And if you know how that ex Exodus story goes, God says, okay, you want to play hardball? Let's play hardball. And then come the 10 plagues. It gets very intense. And who wins that showdown? So we could go to Exodus 12, which I usually do, where, where at, at, at the Passover, when the death, you know, the death angel, the destroyer is coming, God says, this night I will have victory over the gods of Egypt. It wasn't just that night. <laughs> it was the whole thing, okay? On their gods, the Lord executed judgments, plural. Um, all the plagues have something to do with this. So let's get into a few of them. You have the Nile turned to blood in Exodus 7. I'm not going to go out to all the passages. A lot of these are going to be familiar to you. Why would that be a big deal? Who's supposed to maintain the correct working of the Nile? Who's supposed to maintain Ma'at? Pharaoh. Horus incarnate. So God, through Moses, turns the Nile into blood. Now we know that the Egyptian priests, they can't fix this, but they can mimic it. And they do. They make it worse. Frogs are next. This is an attack on the goddess Hechet, responsible for the control specifically of multiplication of the frogs in the Nile. You had too many frogs, it was a problem for various you know, ecosystem re uh, reasons. And so the Egyptians had a goddess that was, you know, they believed was assigned to this particular aspect of the Nile's ma'at functioning. So Hechet is not on the job. Of course, Pharaoh, everybody's looking at him because he's the one supposed to maintain all this. We've got a big problem if we're Egypt. Our priests can't maintain order. They can't feed the gods their daily offerings. They can't open the doors of the temples to show that the presence of the deity is there in the object, illuminating the temple and the land. The gods are shut down. So God wins that showdown uh, pretty dramatically. And then the Israelites sing a poem about it um, in Exodus chapter 15. It's very important. Exodus 15 is called the Song of the Sea. And the Israelites sing this long poem about the battle and Pharaoh sinking down to the bottom of the sea and his armies and so on. And then we praise God for his ability to, to harness the power of creation to defeat evil and promote justice and goodness. And look at the last line. It's a long poem. Look at the last line of the poem. Who's the true king of the nations? Yahweh, the creator and the God of Israel. It's politics. <laughs> These stories are all about politics. Right? You're like, every page of the Bible is about politics. The biblical drama is essentially about God creating a world and that he wants to rule through human beings. But human beings have declared independence and they redefine right and wrong in their personal interests or tribal interests. And when human beings do that, we create death in the world. We create violence. We create the very opposite of, of Tzedek. In fact, the, the prophet Isaiah in chapter one has this great poem where he says, instead of creating Tzedakah, 
you corrupt rulers have created tzedaka. And tzedaka is a Hebrew word that means cries for help because of injustice. So, that's the, and so the plot tension of the whole Bible becomes this. God's purpose and plan was to share his world with humanity and that God's rule and authority over the creation would be mediated through human beings. But now human beings have declared independence and they don't want to submit to God's rule. They want to become their own rulers. And what does that result in? It results in things like Exodus chapters 1 and 2, injustice, violence, conflict, and death. And so now the question is, what on earth is God going to do? How you guys doing? So how does Jesus solve this problem for us? We've got a problem. The Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures ended with a known problem not being fixed. We have the divine council that rebelled against uh, uh, Yahweh and ruled the nations unjustly. We have the rebel in the garden with us who uh, not only rebelled against God, but brought humanity down in rebellion with him. And now we have a problem waiting on a prophet, waiting on the Messiah, the anointed one to come and save us. Tune in, uh, stay tuned as we always say, the beginning is near. We've got more coming. See you soon.